Welcome, race fans, to Sprint Cup Series qualifying at the Pocono Raceway in Long Pond, Pennsylvania. This is a big, dangerous track because they have three turns, and all three are completely different. You can lose a lot of position on this racetrack quickly, and the best way to start out and get good track position is by qualifying today. 45 cars going for 43 positions, and among the chasers, that first pit stall would look pretty good as they get ready to battle this place. Welcome, everybody, back to the Speed stage. I'm John Roberts alongside of Randy Pemberton. Now, when we talk about dangerous, we mean dangerous in the sense of losing points in this chase. Somebody can go out there, have a bad run at this point in the season with six races to go, and uh, it all starts on Friday to put together an entirely good weekend. Well, you have to have a good weekend here. Like you said, just six to go. You need to knock out top five finishes, to say the least, particularly those guys that are between ninth, 12th, 13th, 14th. If they're going to have any hope, particularly, make, like, say, a David Rudeman, who sits back there in 18th. He has got to have top five finishes across the board the rest of these six races in order to have a shot at making the chase. The other guys that are up there, they're solidified. They can do a little bit of gambling, perhaps try to do some strategy to win a race. Those guys that are outside the chase, well, they may do some strategy just to get the best finish that they can, even if they're not having a good day on the racetrack. So a lot of stuff to, to play out here on Sunday. All right, and the best thing to do to get the most points, of course, is to go out, lead the most laps, and win the race. For more, let's go to Bob Dillner. Well, here's the guy we talked about a little while earlier in the show. The guy smiling from ear to ear, the big Brickyard 400 winner. Can you make it two in a row, though, here? First, I know you got qualifying. Yeah, this has been, this has been a really tough track for me in the past, uh, and we unloaded with a completely different setup, and we thought there were some goods and bads with that. So uh, I'm not real sure. We didn't get a very good qualifying draw, and that's probably going to hurt us in qualifying unless we can get uh, that cloud to come back out. But our Axe Swiss car is uh, its pretty good. This has just been a, it's been a tough track for me, so we'll just have to wait and see. Why is it so tough? Um, well, I'm not real sure. It just, uh, you know, I sat on the pole here in like 2005, I think, and, and we raced really well that year. Um, and ironically, that's the same year I ran really well at Indy. So maybe we can take some of that stuff that we learned at Indy and, and apply it here. Uh, um, speed hasn't really been an issue for me here. It's actually been just the race on Sunday and racing people. Um, this is one of those tracks that you can pass like three guys in one straightaway or you can get passed by three guys in one straightaway. So it's, uh, it's a very challenging track. You know, as we are interviewing him, guys, look what pops out. The sun pops out overhead, and Jamie McMurray's shaking his head a little bit. Hermie? Yeah, and Matt Kenseth also goes out fairly early on in this qualifying session. We talk about qualifying every week, but track position and clean air, all these kind of racetracks is very important. How's your car for qualifying? Uh, I don't know. Our speeds seem to be reasonable in, in practice, so hopefully we'll be able to get a good lap in here, and I'll be able to hit all my all my marks. It's three really unique corners, and you have to hit them all right with them long straightaways on every end of the corner. So hopefully we can get a good lap, get a good spot to start, and uh, more importantly, get our car to handle good tomorrow for Sunday. What's the key to a good qualifying lap here? You mentioned the three different corners. Is there any particular place your car is better that you know you need to capitalize on to get that lap you're looking for? I'm not sure what the key is because I don't usually qualify very well here, but um, yeah, you really got to hit all three of them pretty good, especially for the corners. Well, these guys lined up on the grid to go out. Normally, you want to be at the end of the qualifying run, but right now you want to be in the part of the qualifying run that you get that little bit of cloud cover that can make that little bit of difference. Johnny? Yeah, and Hermie, Matt Kenseth may not qualify well at this racetrack, but he's usually there when all is said and done. We're going to set the grid here in a matter of a couple of moments, but Randy, when it comes to racing here, there was a time a few years ago where they used to say, hey, these to these corners are so different, i got to throw away one of the corners to get my car handling good in uh, two of the three, but nowadays, if you don't handle good in all three, someone's going to blow away from you like Denny Hamlin did. And, and not only that, sometimes the handling is in your head. Did you hear the honesty from Jamie McMurray as well as Matt Kenseth? Let's start with Jamie McMurray. I've never been good here. 2005 or 6 had a good run, good qualifying effort. Hasn't been one of his best racetracks. You have to remember, just similar to a baseball player when he steps at the plate in certain parks, he loves that park. Certain drivers don't like certain racetracks. They can't get a good feel how to get in the corner, when to get on the throttle, what to tell the crew chief on Friday and Saturday how to fix the race car. It all happens. It's all part and parcel of trying to get your whole combination together at any particular racetrack. Some drivers don't like Bristol. Some guys don't like Pope. Pocono, and it all determines, uh, it's all determined by the success that you have there. So uh, we'll have to see if that momentum from Indy capitalizes and uh, Jamie McMurray can, can pull off a good finish and Matt Kenseth as well.
Now, it doesn't matter what track size you're on these days because uh, no matter where you are these days, we have two things that are factored in, double file restarts and a potential of three green-white checker uh, finishes at the end of their laps at the end of this race. And uh, we saw both of them come into play last time we were here. Yeah, without, without a doubt. When you talk about Pocono, there's probably not a more exciting place to see a double file restart and perhaps even a green-white checkered if we have to have them. But you can go four or five wide into a corner here on lap one getting up to speed on a restart. On lap two, you can be three or four wide going into turn one at 200 plus miles an hour, two, three, four wide and three or four deep. Anything can happen. It's going to be a great race. And the guys are going to start putting it on the line right here at Pocono. The chase isn't far away. Qualifying coming up. And matter of fact, this was a track where it all started with the double file restarts just one year ago at the first race. Four time winner at this racetrack. Jeff Gordon is signing a couple of autographs. Mark the Kid Martin is ready to go. And on the other side of the break, Steve Burns will lead the way for our coverage of Sprint Cup Series qualifying. It's time to set the field for Sunday's NASCAR Sprint Cup Series race here at the Pocono Raceway in Long Pond, Pennsylvania. Beautiful summer afternoon. Temperatures high today of about 80 degrees. No threat of rain whatsoever. 45 cars are here for 43 positions. And hi, everybody. Steve Burns, Larry Mack, and Jeff Hamlin. So glad you're with us. A bit of a history lesson. Richard Petty won the very first race here in 1974 from the third position. Numbers don't always mean much, but history tells us 41 of 65 races since then have been won from a top 10 starting position. It's very important. I mean, the thing is, everybody thinks about how wide this racetrack is, Steve. And golly, that means you don't have to worry about qualifying well. Pit road, big wide pit boxes. No, it's very important because for some reason, guys get strung out here, and the way the tires kind of go off, you lose a lot of time when you have to fight your way through traffic. I mean, it's a very tricky racetrack, so qualifying up front, very important. The guys who finished one, two, three, well, they all started in the top six in the spring, talking about Denny Hamlin. So qualifying up front and the luck of the draw is going to be very important today. Jamie McMurray going out early along with Carl Edwards, not good for them, but for guys like Jimmy Johnson, yeah. who was fast in practice, hey, he's got a good draw. He goes out by my standards, almost last as far as the go-go homers are concerned before the go-go homers go out. And, and I think to show you how important qualifying is, a lot to do with the forecast here for tomorrow when these guys will get a couple of one-hour sessions to get ready to race. They know they've got good weather, so a lot of them just focused on qualifying, including Jimmy Johnson and Chad Canal. They set the mark early. Nobody could knock it off. They ended up at the top of the charts for that hour-and-a-half practice session. But I think the fact that a late draw is good. We've got a little bit of an equalizer rolling in here. It's starting to get cloudier. In fact, some dark clouds are moving in. So if you had an early draw like McMurray, you're going, at least I've got some cloud to work with. Another guy that's going to go fairly early that was fast actually spun out at the beginning of that practice session is Denny Hamlin, that 11 car that's won the last two races here. Three of the first five drivers to qualify are Roush Fenway drivers. Wendy Venturini standing by with one of them. Jamie McMurray just rolled off. We're going to get a quick work comment from Carl Edwards. Carl, obviously uh, not the greatest draw for today. What can you get out of this qualifying run? Yeah, I haven't thought too much about the draw. I don't, I don't want to know if it's good or bad, but um, our Aflac Fusion was pretty good in practice. We were, I think, 13th on the board. We feel like, uh, you know, Bob and I were talking about it. We practiced about 35th on the board or something last time we are here. So, you know, hopefully we can go out here and have a pretty good lap. I've just got to hit all my marks and do my job right. I think the car is fast enough. Thanks to Carl Edwards, who's uh, obviously busy getting suited up, guys. Well, Wendy, the first driver's out, as you said. Jamie McMurray on the racetrack. Then it's Carl Edwards, David Reagan, Mark Martin, and Matt Kenson. Larry, you and I have been up here watching some of the qualifying, especially for the Arca, Arca, Arca Series of racing. We just went off a little while ago. Your boy Brandon qualified fourth. But we were talking about even the early practice, how important it was to come through turn three to take the green. And we we're watching Jamie McMurray, winner from Indianapolis, on the track right now, it looked like to me he got through turn three extremely well. Yeah, it's a two lap qualifying, but no different when we were here eight, eight weeks ago for our top 35 guys. I, I can almost guarantee you, I doubt any of them run a second lap because the engine gets very warm with as much tape as you put on the nose. And as you go around this two and a half mile racetrack, you start to lose grip on the tires. So since you know the money lap is the first lap, how you get through turn three to get down this over 3,700 foot front stretch 
that dictates his speed down that straightaway. So you got to get through turn three really good twice, just like you see McMurray coming onto the front stretch right there. This is a big, big important weekend for Jamie McMurray. He shuts it down, 53.03. Uh, he comes in here 16th in points, 151 points behind that 12th and final Trying to keep that spot. momentum going, so maybe get into this chase. And right now, guys, he is picked up almost six and a half tenths a second over what he practiced at. Well, this was last week at the Brickyard 400 Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Jamie McMurray, he has two wins in 2010, but they're the two biggest races, the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400. And how about Chip Ganassi and Felix Sabatis? They get the triple crown of motorsports, the Daytona 500, the Indianapolis 500, and now the Brickyard 400 all in the same year. All I can say is my years, as far as I'm concerned as an owner, it'd be time we can just take a long vacation. Don't need to do much better than that, do you, Larry? It's about as good as it gets. Now, one thing about Jamie McMurray, his lap is quicker already than the pole was when we were here eight weeks ago in June. Kyle Busch sat on the pole at a 53-10. And you talked about that earlier in this morning's practice. You felt like with the guys getting cars tuned up, track cooling off just a little bit, we could see that uh, time right there better than what it was in the spring. So right now, McMurray's put up a pretty decent time. Oh, I think we're going to get well down into the 52-second brackets. I don't know that we'll get to that track record of 52-16 that Casey Kane set back in uh, June of 2004, but I think we're going to get down into the 52s. I doubt that'll happen. But stranger things have happened. Carl Edwards won the very first time he raced here in the Cup Series and won again in 2008. His first win coming in 2005. He has 11 starts here. He actually only has two top 10 starts as far as qualifying. And he was actually 13th in practice, a little bit quicker than McMurray in practice session. We watch Carl Edwards. Wendy is standing by with Dale Earnhardt Jr. I know how much Dale Jr. Lance McGrew talked about this race car in practice. Is it where you want to be for qualifying, Dale? I don't think so, but um, uh, we only had one run and it wasn't very good, so we made a ton of changes. We'll see what we got. We're going to drive the heck out of it and see what happens. How important is qualifying at this racetrack? It's pretty important. It's uh, kind of tough to pass here. Um, clean air and the cars get strung out real big, uh, real quick. So uh, even if you do can't get by guys, it's another you know football field to the next car. So uh, it's important to try to get started up front or at least get up front in the race somehow. All right, thanks to Dale Jr. One pole here at Pocono. Steve? All right, thank you very much, Wendy. Carl Edwards, 53-46. Yeah, he only picked up about three tenths from what he ran in practice. And again, you'll see he's one and done. Jeff, we, we talked about some similarities between this racetrack and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but front stretch here, I've heard a lot of guys talk about how rough it is. It, it really is. I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge when you go to Indianapolis. You look and you can see right now the car on the right, the 42 car Juan Pablo Montoya, very fast in Indianapolis. Look how the front end is down, never moving. Look to the left, you see the car here at Pocono. I mean, the car is really skewed out, but you see that front valence. I mean, that splitter up and down, up and down, especially going off into turn one. The car gets to bouncing. Uh, if, you, if your front end is bouncing too much, you lose the front of the car to run up the racetrack. If the car is a little bit too loose, rough as it is, it'll kick the back end looser. Not at all like we should experience at Indianapolis. We don't have a lot of banking in the corners here. We don't have that at Indy. But the key thing is this place is so worn out, so rough, it really challenges the crews. David Reagan has seven cup starts here. You see his best starting position is 16th. Best finish of fifth. You know, the amazing thing about Roush Fenway racing, yeah, they've got two or three wins here, but Roush Fenway, and most of these came with Mark Martin, I might add. Roush Fenway has finished second here 12 different times. Yeah, Mark has finished second himself here six times. Half of those 12. Yep. And David Reagan was 30th quickest in practice in the six car. So you see uh, he's going out here third. His teammate Matt Kenseth fifth. So that'll be three of the four Roush Fenway cars going out in the first five cars. David 24th in points. 
But, you know, back to what Jeff was talking about on that splitter, if you had a perfect arrow world, which there's nowhere we go that we have that, Indy may come as close as any place, that splitter, it starts four inches off the ground. In the perfect world, working with the front suspension and all, you would have that thing just thousandths of an inch off the, the asphalt all the way across. But when you have to start at four inches, you can't start it any higher, you can't start it any lower, it puts you in a pretty small window and then you add the bumps to it, the guy that works that out the best, that's the guy that's gonna run the fastest. Well, Larry, right now, David Reagan and that crew over there, Donnie Wingo, they've really done a great job with the six car because in practice, he was 30th quickest, you talked about that, but he was at a 54-2, qualifies at a 53-2, picks up second. Coming up, Mark Martin, Matt Kenseth, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and that guy, Joey Logano. Stay with us. Qualifying for Pocono is presented by Subway Restaurants. So many $5 foot-long subs to choose from. Enjoy amazing value at Subway all day, every day. Brought to you in part also by Toyota. And by Sprint, the Now Network. Mark Martin, the fourth driver to qualify, 45, scheduled to take time here. We mentioned just a moment ago, Mark, never a winner here on this uh, tricky triangle, but second six times. 47 starts in all for Mark here at Pocono. And Steve, he nailed turn one. I mean, he really made up a lot of ground down through there. Car did, it bobbled a little bit, but he never got out of the throttle, and he's really hustling around this three-corner racetrack here at Pocono. You know, it was interesting to listen to Mark's post-race comments at Indianapolis. He actually fired back at the media just a little sure bit did. about his performance. He said, you know, I'm happy the way we're running right now, but I, I guess it's like I tell Brandon all the time. At the end of the day, the box score is what counts. And when you look at his last seven races, his best finish was 11th at Indianapolis last week. He has not had a top 10 finish since finishing fourth at Charlotte back in May. That's the reason the media ask him about his performance right now. Larry, 5306 for Mark Martin, second of four drivers to qualify. We go back to Wendy. Thanks, Steve. Joey Logano, one of the next ones to go out shortly. A cloud cover came over. Joey, how much is that going to help you? You got to be happy to see that. Uh, as long as it's still there and I go out, I'll be happy to see it. Uh, We'll see, you know, uh, Home Depot Toyota unloaded pretty good in race trim today. Um, we, we struggled a little bit in qualifying trim, we're just too loose, but uh, I feel like the speed's there. Uh, we just gotta get it a little bit better. So hopefully we made the right adjustments. I know the guys uh, been working hard on this thing. So uh, hopefully we're a good qualifying spot and uh, race as good as we did last time here. Good luck to Joey Logano, who likes Pocono, has a win here in the ARCA Racing Series. Bob? Well, Wendy, as Larry Mack said, David Reagan picked up a bunch from his mock qualifying run in practice. Was it the cloud or just the incentive to beat your teammate Carl Edwards? A little of both, and you throw Donnie Wingo in the equation, and, and that's where the extra speed came from. Certainly, we're not on top of the board, but, you know, our UPS forward, we got here, and we are really tight and really working to get over the bumps in turns one and two, and so we changed a lot on our car, and so... It, it's nice to qualify two consecutive Pocono races without any rain, so uh, we're glad that we're going to have some time tomorrow to get our car to drive a little better, but um, you know, maybe that'll wind up in the top 20 or top 15 or so. Let me tell you something. When I asked him about beating Carl, he had a big old smile on his face. I imagine so, Bob Dillner. Well, Matt Kenseth in the 17 car, 21 starts here at Pocono. Boy, his car just really evil off the tunnel turn. You carry so much speed there, and the car just lunges against the outside wall, and a lot of times you have to yank the steering wheel because the front end won't turn, and then the back gets loose. Matt comes in here eighth in points, and he is 189 points ahead of 13th. He's picked up uh, about a half a second from what he practiced, but he's fifth out of the five cars, the slowest of those three Roush Fenway cars. Matt Kenseth, another driver who has never won here at Pocono. I think you'll see what I was talking about right here. In the, the, a lot of drivers say the tunnel turn is one of the trickiest turns in all of Sprint Cup. May have got against that say, curve You saw what happened. He got up on that uh, that curve right there, and that's really what unloaded that race car and shot him up the racetrack. And that, indeed, is almost like curbing 
<laughs> alongside of a road. I mean, it's it's pretty high over there. Let's go to Bob Dillner. Mark Martin just climbed out of his race car, and uh, this is a track I know you like a lot. You've had a lot of success here, but how about this weekend? Well, we sure would like to win with uh, HendrickCars.com. Uh, everybody needs to check them out at HendrickCars.com. Um, we'd like to win this thing, but I just couldn't drive. I haven't been able to drive the car hard. Uh, it gives me mixed signals, like, you know, it snaps and does different things, and I'm afraid that I'm, I'm going to wreck it. I almost wrecked it a couple times, and I feel like I could drive harder, but it gives me these mixed snappy signals with the back end. and. Uh, we need to get that under control. Uh, you know, we really believe in, in what we're doing right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. We've got a lot of work to, to go in front of us, but we're digging hard trying to get the speed back. We haven't, uh, haven't felt as good about it as we did last weekend at Indy, but uh, we're, we're still working. All right, Steve Burns, that's got to be a scary thing for a driver when it snaps loose coming off the corner. Well, I think the biggest thing, he, he said it, it, it's giving him mixed signal. In other words, it's it's not doing the same thing every corner, not doing the same thing every lap, and that's that's hard to work on, and it's hard to anticipate what that car is going to do. As we watch Dale Earnhardt Jr., uh, Mark also fired back at the media, and he said, you have disrespected me by continuing to ask where I'm going to drive next year. He's not happy with that scenario with Casey Kane coming to Hendrick Motorsports. Yeah, it, uh, it's going to get interesting over the next 16 weeks of racing. Dale Earnhardt Jr., fourth out of six. Jeff Gordon, Regan Smith, Kevin Harvick coming up. So is Casey Kane. He's watching qualifying with you. Four wins and two poles for Jeff Gordon here at the Pocono Raceway. Glad you're with us for NASCAR Sprint Cup Series qualifying. Jamie McMurray is the quickest thus far through six drivers. Steve, we were talking earlier today in uh, at first practice about how some good news had come out of this 24 camp. Yep. Veteran crew chief Steve Letard had signed an extension on his contract to be the head man on this 24 to 2014. Yep. Kind of matches up with his driver, Jeff Gordon. And you talked about the continuity that should bring to this program. Also found out this week they'll have a new spotter beginning this weekend. Jeff Dickerson will take over for Shannon McGlamory. McGlamory has been with Gordon since 2007, but McGlamory will stay as a mechanic at Hendrick Motorsports. And Jeff Dickerson has been spotting for Kyle Busch in everything he races in. Truck Series, Nationwide, and Cup for a number of years. Jeff Gordon was seventh quickest in practice. He Larry, ran a 53-54. He got across the tunnel turn. He got out of it just a little bit early, got the car turned in, and then really nailed the throttle coming across through there. So turn three could be the difference right now between him sitting on the pole and maybe starting second or third. I believe. the best lap I've made around here in a while, I believe. <laughs> agree, <man. laughs> I agree, I <laughs> agree. You're pretty good in the back here. Let's see what it is. Oh, yeah, 52-87. 52-87, P1, man. That's a nice lap, real nice lap. Sounds like a man that just signed a contract. Yeah. <laughs> Should we have him on trackside tonight? Absolutely. Uh, hey. We'll have plenty to talk to him about. To come. I'm just going to go through like one of those little rental car buses through the coach lot tonight. Put a little sign up. <laughs> crew chiefs, crew chiefs, Call crew Karen. chief shuttle. Call Karen. Let's put a little yellow we've got a crew chief show tonight right. yep. on seven trackside, 7 o'clock Eastern. But, guys, literally, he got down that short straightaway right there, got to the tunnel turning. Throttled out of it just a little bit, but as soon as that car turned in, he got back and nailed that throttle, and here he came. Yeah, he was one of the ones that was talking about that that's one of the trickiest corners mm -hmm. on the entire Sprint Cup Series schedule, but he said when you nail it right, you can have the most fun in that corner. It's fast. Years ago, uh, doing interviews for this racetrack, Terry Labonte had one of the best or funniest answers. We talk about how tricky this place is, challenging. Terry Labonte, what's your favorite turn here? The one that leads to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Terry didn't have a lot of success at Pocono. Wendy? AC Kane was watching qualifying just like all of us, and the sun has popped back out. How much do you hate to see that? Well, it's, these first few guys have actually had a really good track. It seems like the track actually, for some reason, the first couple cars here always go fast anymore, so it's, uh, changed or something but uh, it should be hopefully decent you know we had our 20th in practice which wasn't as good as we'd like but we made a lot of changes 
to the Budweiser forward, hopefully it's in the right direction. What makes it a good qualifying lap here at Pocono? Well, hitting the, getting off all the corners, you know, it's, it's such long straightaway, so you need to come to the green really good. And then, uh, you know, off a of turn one is really critical too on your lap. So if you can do that, hopefully you can be in the ballpark. But we just struggled off the corners in practice. If we get that better, we'll be pretty quick. All right, good luck to you, Casey. Steve? Regan Smith up, Wendy. Eighth driver to qualify. Whoa. Oh, hang on, Regan. Yeah, a little slide. Now see, if he even if he was going to try to run the second lap because of where that happened, it Killed would him. kill this lap mm -hmm. too. It does. 53.89 for Regan Smith, the slowest of eight drivers. You know, Steve, you were pointing out to me, and we talked to Joey Logano about the cloud covering. We may be losing that cloud cover. Yep. Looks like the sun's popping back out, but uh, you want to see what your hands full looks like through turn three of Pocono. I think we may have a little shot here of this 78 car. There's a patch of asphalt there, and he Ooh. was on what we call the grip strip, but the car just got loose and then that four-wheel slide. That's a patch of asphalt that they put down about two or three years ago, and that's starting to lose grip, but that's still where everybody seems to run. And, Bob, it looks like the man that's on the pole probably loved the grip strip. I'm sure he did. Let's find out why he called it the best lap in a long time here. Well, this is a tough place to put all three uh, corners together or however many the corners are around this place. And, you know, uh, we made some adjustments from, from practice to qualifying that I thought were positive. I caught a little bit of a cloud. And, um, yeah, I just felt like I got off of, uh, of turn three, coming to the green good. And I thought, I thought I got through one good. Tunnel was marginal. It was not the best I've ever been through there, but still pretty solid. And I got through three solid. So I felt just all the way around it was a solid lap. I don't know if it's uh, going to be the best lap we're going to see here today, but I mean, I'm hoping that puts us in the top five. Going good so far for Jeff Gordon. He's won here four times. Yeah, the man has led 879 laps and 35 starts at this racetrack. And you know how you do that? By starting up front. He has done that on many occasions. Joy Logano in the 20 car. Now, Joy was 12th quickest earlier. A brand new race car they've brought here for him this weekend. And now, Larry, he clipped that apron right there, that uh, rumble strip just a little bit through the tunnel turn and upset the car just a little bit on the exit. And you see that our tracker right there reflecting it. Had a great recovery last week at Indy to finish ninth. Second year in a row up there had to start at the rear of the field because of an engine change from practice. 53-24, that puts him fourth quickest right now as he's the first Toyota to qualify. Coming up, we'll see Kevin Harvick, Ryan Newman, Kevin Conway, and Casey Kane. Joey comes in here 19th in the Sprint Cup Series points with six races to go to the chase, 205 points behind 12th place Clint Boyer. And is that reachable? Numbers-wise, it is. I, I just think, reality wise, right? It, it, you know, he's dependent on two huge things: his performance every week, right, and the performance of all those guys in front of him. More so, the lack of their performance, and I just that's going to be a tall order in six races. When you talk about anybody that's outside the top twelve right now, Steve, it's a double-edged sword. You got to cut it both ways. You got to do your part, and you got to have some help by some other folks. Kevin Harvick on the racetrack. Jeff, we go down to Wendy. Well, I know Clint Boyer had a relaxing week back at home. Is that going to relate to a great qualifying lap today? I hope so. I don't know what got into Gordon, but that's a big lap he put up there. Uh, we're all going to be chasing that. But, you know, our car was good. It wasn't quite as good as it was in the spring right off the truck. But um, we adjusted on a little bit. I think, uh, you know, Shane made some good calls. Hopefully we can get the Hartford Chevrolet in the top five. You know, and uh, hopefully we put it on cool. You worried about this weather changing, the sun peeking in and out of the clouds? Yeah, he must have had a cloud or something, huh? <laughs> no comment on that. Use if we don't, though, right? Yeah, sure. We'll go with that. Cliff Boyer has a few more cars before he gets to go out. His teammate on the racetrack. Well, Wendy, we can finally get down to business. Larry Mack has taken his shoes off, which means he's finally comfortable. Yeah, I look down, and we still got a lot of cars to go. Yeah. So, you know. Whoa, <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> nine years about <laughs> all that was over there on the exit of third two. It's kind of like stick, please, stick, stick. Here's a little nugget about Kevin Harvick. 19 starts for Harvick here at Pocono. He finally led his first laps here in June. Yeah, this has not been one of the best racetracks. He only has six top tens. 
But I look back at how well he ran at Indy last week, and like Jeff had pointed out earlier, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to run good here, but at least it gives you some good confidence coming here one week later. Fourth quickest. 53.20 for Kevin Harvick. That's 169.163 miles per hour. Well, Sprint brings you an inside look at what's happening now inside the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series. For more NASCAR stats, in-car audio, and live race radio, check out NASCAR Sprint Cup Mobile at sprint.com slash speed. And that's why they call it the Tricky Triangle, just three corners here, and it is a monster of a racetrack. You see the banking down in turn one, and, and when they get there, they are well over 190 miles an hour, close to 214 degrees of banking. And then that tunnel turn, only eight degrees of banking over there in turn two. I was just going to add, I've seen 202 miles an hour down in the turn one so far, early part of this qualifying session. And you use the brakes pretty hard here, three times a lap, especially twice a lap, getting into turn one and getting into turn three. Steve Ryan Newman here on the track. Now he, he clobbers, he clobbered yes, he that, that rumble strip down there. He was third quickest in practice, but uh, he's about to hustle through turn three if he wants to make up some ground now. Talk about another guy needing a big weekend. Boyer, excuse me, Ryan Newman, 15th in points. He is 147 behind Clint Boyer. And see the problem, that, that is real close to a full, full race. race out. But now we'll say this, even though every year is different as Ryan Newman ends up second quickest, in 2005, with six races to go, Matt Kenseth was 213 points out, and he did make the chase. Well, Jeff talked about Ryan Newman clobbering the inside curb. Let's take another look. Car comes down there, all of a sudden, you'll see that left front kind of jump. There you go, right there. Ooh. That wheel just wobbled a little bit. Now, that looked like a lot, folks, but that can kill your speed right hey, there. Hey, could have been lot. the difference between taking the pole position and not. It very well could have been a difference in a little over a 10th. But the problem, we keep, I think, driving home the point that this place is so rough. When you hit that curb, the car doesn't immediately settle down because you get into the bumps as well. Gil Martin and Kevin Harvick. And the thing is, right now, with well, the 10th pickup, would have gotten enough to beat Jeff Gordon. And, uh, Bob, I believe you got one of the guys that just finished, uh, our point leader, I should say, down there with you right now. That's right. Kevin Harvick talking to Gil Martin here about his race car. And I heard you on the radio. You like your race car. Why? It just drives good. Uh, we unloaded good, and, and uh, his car's been good in race trim. And anything better than 35th is going to be good for us in qualifying. So um, guys have done a good job, and looking forward to Sunday. What's the plan to do the double duty at Iowa this week, going back and forth and so forth? Uh, we'll do everything here and then we'll go to Iowa um, tomorrow and, and just uh, if we make qualifying, we do and, and we'll just race. All right, Kevin Harvick likes his qualifying effort so far, boys. Yeah, along with the guys like Carl Edwards, Brad Keselowski, and Paul Menard that's running the full schedule of both series. Uh, Kyle Busch, Kevin Harvick, Michael McDowell, Joe Nemechek, Reed Sorensen, Kyle Busch, all of those guys will be going over to Iowa to run in that race over there in the Nationwide Series. Steve, what he's talking about last in the spring, Kevin Harvey qualified 22nd, but he was able to race his way to fourth. Larry, you were talking about double duty. Don't forget the Camping World Truck Series here. Four drivers doing double duty between the Cup Series and the Camping World Truck Series. A lot of guys that we don't normally see running in the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series. Of course, Todd Bodine, we see him there because he's the points leader. But Denny Hamlin, Casey Kane, and Elliot Sadler, who will be driving for Kevin Harvick, all doing the double duty here at Pocono. And at 10 o'clock Eastern in the morning, very unique qualifying session. Uh, it's not necessarily the Nationwide Series road course style qualifying, but there will be probably at least three trucks at a time out on the racetrack. First time ever for the Camping World Trucks here at Pocono. And I bet you they'll put on a well of a show. And then following that, a doubleheader, DW is going to be in the booth with Rick Allen and Phil Parsons, the ARCA Racing Series. And Larry, let's remember now, if you tune in, you don't want to miss any of it because the guys who are the fastest in practice will go out and last. Yeah, yeah this, this practice coming different. up next is pretty important Very for important more for them. than just practice. But they're not allowed to draft qualifying. Oh, correct? no, that'll, that'll get you time yep. this, this uh, disallowed. And, you know, our buddy Elliot Sadler, he was the fastest yeah. that number two truck driving for Kevin Harvick this weekend. Austin Dillon was second quick. 
Here's Casey Kane in this nine car. Casey was only 22nd quickest in that practice session. Had a well of a ride back here in June. Qualified eighth, was working his way back yeah. up to the top 10 when we had a green-white checkered. And probably he might say it was one of the hardest crashes he's ever had on the back stretch between turn one and turn two. Casey Kane won from the pole position here in 2008. He got ran off the racetrack by his teammate, no Six, less. Said A.J. Allmendinger blocked him. Yep. Those trees right there are just now growing back. I thought I was about halfway down that straightaway. And Casey's one of those guys. Now, based on his performance, even though he didn't perform at Indy uh, like I think everyone anticipated, ended up finishing 13th, he's 156 points out, which is just right on top of one race. If these guys can run like they've run the last month and a half, they indeed may can get there. But every race, they've got to be spot on. I'm not saying they got to win the race, but they're going to have to click off top fives. Well, he's going to some good racetracks for him. He's had some good runs a year ago with a win also. So uh, he, he's the kind of car that could do it. Jeff, 53-22 for Casey Kane places him sixth of 13 drivers who have qualified. Let's go back to Bob. 0 0.089 seconds is the difference between Jeff Gordon and you, Ryan Newman, right now. How was that lap, and did you miss anywhere on the racetrack? What, what does it matter? My, does my answer matter at all? Sure. <laughs> no, I was a little tight in turn one, but uh, I felt like I was really good in the tunnel turn and um, pretty good down in turn three, but um, I think I gave up most of my time in turn one. How'd you give up that time? Was it uh, pushing Just too hard? Taking my time. I didn't want to rush into <laughs> it. You know, I wanted to get faster as the lap went. Like a Sunday drive. No, Friday drive. That's right. Tried to, tried to do a little bit better on Sunday for Ryan Newman. Said he lost a little bit in turn number one, boys. Bob, thanks very much. Coming up, Mark Trex Jr., Scott Speed, Paul Menard. We see Marcus Ambrose standing by. They're all shooting at Jeff Gordon. Martin Truex Jr. on the racetrack in his Napa Toyota for Michael Waltrip Racing. Jeff Gordon is the driver to beat right now. Gordon at 170.222 miles per hour, 52.872, the time and speed to beat. Larry, he looked loose. Oh, that car was so evil off the tunnel turn, turn two. It's like it, it was pushing, pushing, yanked the wheel, bad loose, and I think the stopwatch reflects it. 12th out of our 14 cars at a 53.58. So they'll have their work cut out for them when they drop the green flag on Sunday. Wendy. Marcus Ambrose qualified 16th when we were here in the spring. Marcus, how was your car earlier today? 18th, can you better that for qualifying today? Yeah, it was pretty good in uh, race trim, not so great in qualifying trim, but uh, this is a tough track to lay a lap down. You know, the surface is old, it's very fast, uh, very line sensitive, especially through that tunnel turn. But we're confident, feel like if I actually lay a decent lap down, we'll be somewhere near the top 10. Is it difficult to focus on a qualifying lap and your race car when you have all this media attention surrounding you this week? No, I guess it's a good thing to have media hanging around, but uh, I actually feel relieved. You know, this decision's been a while coming. Uh, certainly the future's uncertain as we sit here today, but I think I feel more relief than anything knowing that uh, the decision's been made to move on, allow JTG to, um, to focus their efforts um, and help them get to where they want to go for the rest of this year. All right, thanks to Marcus, and we look forward to seeing where he may go in 2011. And Wendy making mention of the fact that Marcus Ambrose has announced that he's leaving JTG Doherty Racing. And as quickly as Marco said that, the announcement came the following day that Bobby Labonte will be in that 47 next year. You know, something I didn't realize, all total, including the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series, the Nationwide Series, and the Sprint Cup Series, uh, this is the fifth year for JTG Doherty Racing and Marcos Ambrose to be together. Says it's time for change. Things perhaps have gotten a bit stale, but a lot of speculation that he'll wind up at Richard Petty Motorsports. He was a Ford factory driver in Australia, where he was the V8 Supercar champion twice. Of course, Richard Petty Motorsports campaigning Fords. Scott Speed, meanwhile, the 15th driver to qualify. You, you know, this is another organization that I think I'm sure more than anybody has their own head being scratched. Just. I, I know things kind of got disjointed when Brian Vickers got sick, but honestly, before Brian got sick, the performance wasn't even close with these Red Bull cars, and they just struggle week in and week out, it seems like, with both of these cars, with Reed Sorensen driving the 83 and Scott Speed driving the 82. Right now, he's 12th 
out of the 15 cars. But the good news for Scott Speed, which actually says a lot for a, a guy that's in his second year, he has 23 consecutive races without a DNF going all the way back to Texas last fall. So that's, that's the one thing you, you can hang your hat on. So Jeff Gordon still the driver to beat at a 52-87. Six of the last 10 races here at Pocono have been won from the front row. Like I said, starting front up row. front helps a whole lot. Speaking of Richard Petty Motorsports, here comes Paul Menard in the Menards, number 98. See, Menard has seven starts here at Pocono Raceway. And had a pretty good run, pretty good finish in the June race here. Ended up finishing 16th. And he'll be one of those guys I named off a while ago, including eight drivers that'll be going over to Iowa. And he goes into the Nationwide Series race over there, fifth in the points. Paul was 29th in the hour and a half practice session we had a little earlier today. Bernard will be followed by Clint Boyer, David Rudiman, and Denny Hamlin. Hamlin, a four-time winner here at Pocono. You know, we just had Scott Speed qualify, and we were talking about him. When you look back at the first four or five races, the way the 82 of Scott Speed and this 98 of Paul Menard started the season off, you went, boy, they are really going to have a good solid season. But they got about four or five races into it and just kind of fell off the map. Menard finished 14th at Indy after starting 26th. Now he's going to be 10th at a 53-44. Just in front of Carl Edwards and Matt Kenseth. Larry, you're right. They were off to a quick start. But uh, I think it's important to mention that Menard, 23rd in points, 10 spots ahead of where he was at this time last year. And, and I think, you know, that's what you have to look at is yep. just is whether it's baby steps or big steps is making sure that each year in, 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 it, in defense of Richard Petty Motorsports, ju just look at everything they went through late in the game last year, uh, making the switch from Dodge to Ford, making the swap from Statesville over to Concord as far as shops. There were a lot of things going basically from a three-car team to a four-car team. There were a lot of things that happened to Richard Petty Motorsports in a short period of time. Larry, look here right quick. Turn one, a lot of sun in that part of the racetrack. But I looked at the other end about where the uh, tunnel turn is all the way back into turn three. Looky here, total shade right now. The clouds are really covering turn three. Could be a big benefit for these guys. Once again, we've been talking about the track temperature. I know when we started qualifying, track temperature is around 112 degrees. This is going to help a lot, give these guys some speed through that part of the racetrack. Yeah, you can see it right there as Clint Boyer in his 33 car comes through there to take the green flag. Jeff Gordon can hang on to the pole position to be his 69th career pole. You know what was interesting about that race at Indy last week is, is Clint Boyer had a good run. Greg Biffle had a good run. But the problem is everybody in that 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th range, all of them had a good run. So it was hard to separate yourself much. Larry, don't look now, but he got through the tunnel turn and he is on a pole run. The turn three is going to be pivotal here for Clint Boyer. Yeah, we talked to him earlier. His left. In that practice session. Oh, he's getting loose. Oh. He's getting loose. He's getting loose. Ah, oh, he has I'm, such a great lap going. But I'm not believing he saved that. Damn near lost it right Ooh. there. You're right, big guy. You not, missed about did. No, not damn near. You did. <laughs> he just didn't hit anything. Yeah. But he had a great run going. Man. And just, you know, turn three. Good job. Good save has been the Achilles heel for everybody. Denny Hamlin spun out off of turn three earlier in that practice session. You'll see he goes down the short chute, turns it off into turn three. He's right there on that fresh part of asphalt. But he also had the left side wheels a little bit lower. lower and that's what that. Denny Hamlin no told us in an interview. I was uh, had my left side wheels out of that fresh piece of asphalt, and it just broke loose. And almost wow. like it turned in too good, and he got down below that. Like Larry said, left rear tire, no grip, and around the car came. Like I say, great save by him. I know it's not going to be good for qualifying. He's 16th 
quickest right now, but the good thing is he's not going to a backup car. We'll catch our breaths and come back. Jimmy Johnson can't believe he saved it either. Hamlin, Montoya, and Ambrose coming up. 11th of 18 drivers who have qualified here at Pocono. Well, tomorrow, history will be made as the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series battles here for the first time. Series biggest names fight and get back into championship contention. Don't miss the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series live from Pocono tomorrow at 1230 Eastern here on Speed as we watch Denny Hamlin, four-time winner here at Pocono. He's got a couple more quarters to go, but he seems to be on a pretty good run now. Turns it off into turn two, the tunnel turn. Car wiggled just a little bit there. Didn't slow him down though. Now that ever important flat turn three that just goes forever and ever and ever. Boy, it's going to be awfully, awfully close, but I believe he's going to do it. Yes, 52-82 beats Jeff Gordon by a half of a tenth of a second. Puts him on the stop. And there goes the Jeff Gordon notes. Poor Russell. It's the curse of Russell. Yep. Every time he prepares some pole position notes. It's been happening a lot a here lot. lately. I'm telling you, when Sorry, those guys Jeff. in the garage area find out about it. Sorry to Jeff Gordon. We'll put a stop to it. Yep. So Denny Hamlet at a 52.82. That's 170.371 miles per hour. You talked about his four wins here. He has completed 1,688 laps at Pocono. He has led almost 500 of those laps, right at about 38, 29%. 30%, wow. Juan Pablo Montoya had a heartbreaking Sunday at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the second year in a row. Let's take a look at what happened. It sat on the pole, led 86 laps, got put back in the field with about 20 laps to go. Just got in too hot into turn four, hits the wall, goes across the racetrack, and nowhere for Dale Earnhardt Jr. to go. And for the second year in a row at the Brickyard 400, the man that just dominated the field walks away with not a whole lot to talk about. A lot to talk about, just not a whole lot to show for it. His teammate won the race, but all things being equal, he, uh, he would have preferred to have been the guy that went to victory lane. Well, remember, Chip Ganassi said that a year ago, that 20 minutes after all that happened, that the race was over with, it was all forgotten. Just real curious if this is going to happen again this week, because so far, he's looking pretty fast over the tunnel turn out of turn three. Boy, he got off the tunnel turn really good. I mean, he's a tenth and a half better than Denny Hamlin right now. If he doesn't overdrive drive turn three. I mean, the way this lap is going, he may be down in the 52 60s. He has seven starts here. He's never started better than seventh until now. 171.096 miles per hour, 52 60. That kind of helps uh, to heal some hurt feelings after the, what happened in Indianapolis. And we talked about the track temperature early on, about 112 degrees. And Bob Dillner, What's the track temperature looking like now? Because that might be helping a lot of these guys go faster. Well, the track temperature is actually down to 103 degrees right now, really cooling off down here. Maybe it helped Denny Hamlin, but I'm not so sure because you've had a fast car all day, and you told us earlier that it wasn't handling good. Is it still fast and not handling good? Still not there. I mean, it. Uh, I told him it. You know, the the time might look okay, but uh, we got got some work to do. Um, which the most encouraging thing is is. It's <laughs> As bad as this thing's handling right now, we are, uh, we got some speed out of it, and that's that's opposite of what we usually are. So uh, I have no doubt that tomorrow we're going to fine tune this thing. And we'll have something good. That's pretty incredible. That fast, but it's not a good race car. Yeah, but the thing I want to say about this guy right here in this team, they've got a fast race car every week. Every week every they week. just cannot, for one reason or the other, sometimes self-inflicted, seal the deal. <laughs> Juan Pablo Montoya at a 52.60 is the quickest of 20 drivers who have qualified. Can Kyle Busch beat him? Sorensen 18th of 21 drivers who have qualified. 
Juan Pablo Montoya the quickest at a 52-60 as we watch Marcus Ambrose. Let's go back, back to Bob Dillner with Juan Pablo. Well, Steve, Juan Pablo Montoya and I have been talking about his best qualifying effort here and how important would it be for you to start on the front row? I think it'd be huge. I think track position is huge. Uh, this track can do the same way, so I'm pretty happy. You know, we got a little bit of a different approach this week on what we've been doing on the car. I know Indy we run really good, but for some reason we always run good there, so it's, it's not, you know, this target shape has been amazing. And I want to thank all the guys. You know, I know the one car won last week, but everybody as well on the 40 crew. They're doing a really good job. You know, last week we, we really hadn't covered all day and just one, one little mistake. But, you know, as I always told them, we win together, we lose together, so it's good. Juan pointed out to me his best qualifying effort here, a sixth a couple of years ago. But this is a track, Bob, that he struggled at when he first started running in the Sprint Cup Series, but he finished second here a year ago, finished eighth in the June race, and Marcos Ambrose in the 47 ends up 11. Looked like his car was in a four-wheel slide all the way around the racetrack. It didn't look like he had any kind of really good grip at all. Like you say, Larry, just really up on top of the racetrack. 53-34 for Marcus Ambrose. Speed's coverage of NASCAR Sprint Cup qualifying for Pocono is brought to you by Camping World. Visit Camping World RV Sales for the best values on fifth wheel trailers starting at only $249 a month. And by Priceline, home of the big deal. Right now, Juan Pablo Montoya is the big deal, but Tony Stewart's had success here at Pocono. Two wins and a pole position for Stewart. Yes, yeah, Steve, he's finished in the top 10 here in nine of his last 10 races. 17 top 10s and 23 starts. This has been a pretty good uh, track for him qualifying 13 top 10 starts. And right now he is flirting with that time of 52.60 by Montoya. And you know, we were talking about the pole speed Kyle Busch laid down in June of this year, just eight weeks ago, we're right at a half a second quicker than that now. There, I noticed in turn one as well as the tunnel turn. So he got out of the throttle a little bit early, got the car turned down in the corners, and both times went straight back to the throttle, made a lot of ground up on the exit of the corner. And Jeff, it looks like that's exactly what he's going to do here. He's working on being a I 10 better. He's there. working on a 50 in his 14 car. Yes, sir. 52-51. Oh, good job, buddy. He won. 52-51. 171.393 miles per hour for Tony Stewart. Wendy. And Kyle Busch just getting the time of Tony Stewart there. 52-51 of Stewart. Can you beat that and uh, double up your poll from eight weeks ago? I don't think so. I was hoping for a 90, but uh, depending on cloud cover, we'll see what this M&M's Camry has in store. And, you know, I think the car was pretty good. It was definitely a um, you know, top five car in practice. I think we ended up fourth or sixth or something. So, um, you know, we're right there, but uh, I, don't, I don't know about a 5250. That's a pretty tall order. How much has the track changed from when we were here two months ago? Because it seems like obviously we're faster. Yeah, I, I think the temps may be just a little bit cooler, you know, not as much sun, a little bit more clouds in and out, which is keeping track temp down, just helping speed. All right, good luck to Kyle Busch. Steve? Thank you very much, Wendy. Tony Stewart now the man to beat Juan Pablo Montoya, just bumped by fellow Chevy driver Tony Stewart. We'll be right back. 23 drivers have qualified here at the Pocono Raceway. Jimmy Johnson is the 24th. Just keep getting faster and faster and faster. You know, Tony Stewart picked up nine tenths of a second. Now, this guy right here, he was the quickest at a 53.27. Not a very good looking lap as he's halfway down the long pond stretch right now. To me, Larry, it looked like that car was all over turn one. This is exactly what this car did in June. They were pretty fast in practice, Jeff. And if you remember, one of his worst qualifying sessions of the year ended up qualifying 22nd. He's not going to be that slow, but it's not going to be a pole run for this 48 car. Continues to gain speed through turn three. But yeah, you're right, Larry. 
not what he was looking for. And they did that whole hour and a half of practice focusing on qualifying. He's not even in the top five. He's six at a 52.97. Only picks up about four tenths from practice. Big surprise right there, because again, I thought they'd put a lot of extra effort to come up here and try to get qualified a little bit quicker, but it seemed like it was all in turn one. Eight of the top nine drivers in Chevrolets. Well, tomorrow, history will be made as a Camping World Truck Series battles of Pocono for the first time. Biggest names in the series try to get back into championship contention. Don't miss the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series live from Pocono tomorrow at 1230. Actually, Jeff Hammond just pointed out to me that the 48, they were 25th in qualifying back in June. So they wasn't as good as I gave them credit, but right now. 22nd, 25th, you're back outside that far, the top don't 20, matter. Yeah, but uh, you know, he could indeed maybe barely be inside the top 10 when this is all said and done. Jimmy Johnson followed by Elliott Sadler, Sam Hornis Jr. and Kyle Busch. PJ Jones up next in the seven. And that's a backup car. He hit the wall hard in practice earlier today. And what I'm seeing right here, all they're going to try to do is make a circle with the seven car. In fact, I'm or not even sure he's going to make a circle. Something is totally wrong with that race car. Or a triangle, as it were. Yeah, it, yeah it's like sucked down on the right front. The left front was up. There's, there's definitely something in trouble with this uh, backup seven car. Robbie Gordon getting ready for Watkins Glen down testing at Road Atlanta. This was about halfway through the first practice we had earlier today. It's like he went in that turn one right there, overdrove it a little bit, couldn't get the car to slow down, and all of a sudden it slid all the way to the outside side for Barry, and he hit it hard. Pocono has been hard on this seven crew. In fact, back in June, they missed the show. They were outside the top 35 with Ted Musgrave, and it's been a what I think Jeff and I would look at as a character building day for that crew. <laughs> a lot of adversity to overcome. Mm -hmm. Bob Dillner. Tony Stewart on the provisional pole. How pumped up are you with that lap here at Pocono? I'm really happy. I'm, I'll be honest, I was, uh, I didn't even start the day off good here when I woke up this morning. I uh, raced in Fargo, North Dakota last night with uh, my buddy Donnie Schatz and uh, was running second in the A main at a 410 wing sprint car race and I, I crashed myself into the inside tires knocked the front end down so uh, it was a long ride from Fargo to Pocono last night and I it was about 5 30 when I <laughs> finally went to sleep so uh, really really proud of all these guys in this office deep old spice team and uh, I told Darian I wasn't in a very good mood this morning I was gonna take it out on somebody I just didn't realize I was gonna take it out on the clock <laughs> <laughs> he's all smiles now Wendy and Kurt Busch is all smiles before his qualifying lap how do you think your car is gonna fare in this uh, qualifying effort well, we're hoping for a nice cloud cover like we have right now, and we'll give it our best shot with the Miller Lite Dodge. Uh, those guys on top of the speed charts, those guys have hit really good laps. Uh, just hopefully we'll crack into the 52-second barrier. That's just our, our lofty goal right now. I saw you taking some track temperatures just a second ago. What are you studying, Kurt? Oh, it's pretty wild. Just a cloud versus sun goes three degrees just that fast. And so just over in the shade, though, it's 95 degrees. And so that's been in the shade all along. But right now it's 111 according to my calculations, which it's a little warm. It is. And hopefully that cloud cover will stay here for Kurt Busch. Now, guys, it just dawned on me as we were listening to Tony Stewart. He's another one of those drivers had no idea that God actually made two 530s in the day. He found his from the opposite direction. Most of them have to find it for the first time as they get up. He found it as he was about to lay down and go to bed. Well, you're trying to compare Tony Stewart to Darrell Walter. Well, you, you're saying exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, but that's not fair, and we don't even need to go there. <laughs> no, because he'll be he'll be up here shortly to do a NASCAR Camping World Truck Series practice. Trackside buddy Elliott Sadler, 21st overall, 26th with qualified. Tony Stewart is the man to beat. Good qualifying effort by Sam Hornis Jr. for the Penske team. Olympic paint scheme this week on that 77 car. Hornish, 10th overall of 26 drivers. This has been a pretty good track for that Sam Hornish lately as we watch Kyle Busch in 18 car start his run. You go back to both races last year for Sam, top 10 finishes, finished 11th here in June and led about 16 laps late in that race. 12 wins already for Kyle Busch this season. Two in the trucks, eight in the Nationwide Series, and two in the Cup Series. Well, he's not going to be very good. You heard him when he came on the radio, but you could also see it with the body language of that race car. That car is loose, Steve. 
that on the pole here in June and finished second to his teammate Denny Havlin. This is a brand new race car for Kyle. And we talk about his wins, his win in that Nationwide Series race last week at ORP with his 74th career win in the top three series. 53-35, about mid-pack right now, 16th. Yeah, I think, uh, I think he's batting 500 in the Nationwide Series, eight wins and 16 starts. And he's headed to Iowa tomorrow. Now this is everything a car shouldn't do at Pocono. Ooh. Gets down in there, the car never took a set. You can see right here, you see they've turned it to the right. You can see the front, he just keeps working to the right, trying to make the late exit of this, of this corner here. Car definitely not up underneath him. And every time it hits a bump, it just gets worse. Yep, just chase it up the racetrack. A special edition of Trackside tonight from Pocono. It is, I'm calling it the crew chief extravaganza. All our rowdy friends are coming, coming over, over tonight. tonight. <laughs> Kenny Francis, Kevin Mannion, Chad Canals, who am I missing? Party. Todd Barry. That's it. Crew chief love. And the TaxSlayer.com Chevrolet, 53.38, 168.602 miles per hour for Labani. Saw Tony Stewart there, our current pole sitter. One by one, watching the cars go by as they qualify. He's still got two or three bullets he will have to keep his eye on. Jeff and I were just talking. Kurt Busch, Jeff Burton. Wouldn't rule out our man A.J. Allmendinger because on qualifying day, he can be a humdinger. Sure can. Here's an odd nugget. Kurt Busch has started fourth the last three Pocono races. Good He's working on it. He's working on it right now. Currently seventh. We'll pick up just a little bit here. Boy, I go back to that August 2007 race. Uh, of course, that was with the old car. He led 175 of 200 laps to win that race that day. Also won here in 2005. Led 131 laps that afternoon. So Kurt Busch, ninth overall, and we go to Wendy. Jeff Burton, get ready to climb in. This cloud cover is causing you some good. It's a huge cloud right now, Jeff. How's that going to help you? Well, if it'll stay out, it ain't going to hurt. I can tell you that. Um, we were at Cash Chevrolet was really fast in the race show. I was really happy with it. We made three Q runs, and I never once hit my line on any, three, any of the three Q runs. So we're uh, taking a little bit of guess on what we need to do to the car because I just didn't do a good job in practice. Uh, so hopefully we've, uh, we've guessed correctly. I just didn't give them good information. But... Uh, I feel really good about it. If we, um, if I hit my mark, I think we'll be okay. What kind of advantage is this for you going out so late? Well, I, you know, this, it's not much of an advantage unless you do get cooler temps. You know, if you do get, uh, if you do get cooler track temps, then it, then it certainly is an advantage. But, um, you know, the guys that go late, you know, they when they qualify well, they never, never say it was because of that. But when you go early, and you didn't. You blame it on that. So <laughs> I don't know. It just, honestly, it's just what it does with track temp. And, the track temp continues to fall right now with that cloud cover, then it will certainly help. All right, thanks to Jeff Burton. His best starting position in 2010 has been fifth. And Steve, what Jeff is talking about, we hadn't really probably harped on it a lot today, but our buddy DW, he likes to call this thing a roval. You know, it has uh, some tendencies of a speedway. It's like a short track. It's like a road course. And at a road course, you're always talking about hitting your marks. And this thing is so tricky. you got to get off the the uh, gas at the right place, not overbreak the car, hit that distinctive line that allows the car to be free but, and fast, but not too loose. So a lot of these drivers know that if you mess up in turn one, it hurts you down the, the uh, first straightaway, the back long part straightaway, mess up the tunnel turn, it hurts turn three. So hitting the marks are so important. Hitting them all right is, is critical if you want to sit on the pole. And that's what Tony did. He hit every one of his marks perfectly. I tell you, Brad Keselowski in his 12 car hit his marks perfectly through turn two. He really made a lot of ground getting in on the exit. He's working on a top 10 run, qualified 11th here in June, his only start in the Sprint Cup Series here at Pocono. Looking for his first top 10 finish in the Sprint Cup Series. Ninth overall, he's the fastest Dodge. Penske Dodge, ninth, 10th, and 12th right now. Yeah, they're all right there together. Of course, Brad's another one of those drivers especially being the Nationwide Series points leader that'll be going to Iowa tomorrow. Meanwhile, Tony Stewart. Talking to Claire B. Lang. From Sirius Satellite Radio. Now, Jeff Hammond 
was talking at break, uh, discussing this 43 car. He feels like an AJ may can give old Tony a little bit of a run. He's definitely got some good conditions right now. He, ideal conditions right now to make an effort uh, to unseat Tony Stewart. The fastest forward right now is AJ's teammate, Casey Kane, who is 13th. We do not have a Ford in the top 10, and we only have one Toyota, Denny Hamlin, who is third. So mainly Chevrolets and Dodges up there in the top 10. Yeah, seven of the top eight are Chevrolets. So he does coming through turn three to take the green. Look pretty good through there, Larry. Qualified and finished 16th at the Brickyard 400. Got that pole at Phoenix back in the spring. See how rough that racetrack is going down into turn one. 200 miles an hour, got out of the throttle. See what he does on the exit. He, tracker shows that he really hit this corner or not. Looked like he did a good job of rolling out early because you even no made note that we've seen 201, 202 getting into turn one. But he, he bought, bought benefits on the exit of turn one. 192 miles an hour into that tricky turn two. That turn two is kind of a replica of a turn from Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And then this turn three is, is kind of similar to what the corners used to look like when we would run Milwaukee with the trucks and with the Nationwide Series. It's going to be a good lap, but it's not going to be a pole run. He's by far going to be the fastest forward, seventh quickest at a 52.97. He becomes the seventh car to run in the 52-second bracket. Almondinger's previous best start here at Pocono, eighth. Six appearances for A.J. Almondinger, the California native here at Pocono. Almondinger will be followed by Greg Biffle, David Gilliland, and Jeff Burton. After Burton, we start go or go home qualifying. <laughs> Steve, we know this is a, a good race car they bring here. It's the same car they raced in Indianapolis. They actually hustled back home, cut the uh, right side off of the car, replaced it, and brought it back here because, again, Greg was very happy with the way the car drove. They feel like they got a few things figured out on this race car, so they wanted to give him an opportunity to see what he could do. You see Biffle 11th in points. There's 78 points to the good of 13th place Mark Martin. And that's essentially where Greg was going into Indy. All he did is open up the gap just a little bit back to 13th place, Mark Martin. Right now, Greg is 78 points to the good. You know, this has not been a great racetrack for Greg Biffle. 15 starts here, just two top 10 finishes and one top five. And you know, I talked to his crew chief, Greg Irwin, the other night, and of course they finished third at Indianapolis. That was their first top five finish since finishing fourth at Bristol way back in wow. March. But I look at the way they've been running lately. They had a good top five run going at Chicagoland Speedway a few weeks ago and blew up. And then, of course, we know how good they were the entire weekend at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Qualified seventh seemed to be the only car that could go up there at one point and drive by that 42 car. Oh, they definitely had the second best car at Indianapolis. And right now, turn one, he didn't get through it, but he's been making up speed throughout the rest of the course. Looks like he may wind up getting himself a 12th place qualifying and qualifies 11th in his Ford, second best right there and behind A.J. Allmendinger. 53-14, 169.447 miles per hour. Todd Bodine, the onion, the points leader of the truck series, awaiting his effort. David Gilliland driving the number 37 Ford, sponsored by Gander Mountain, our buddies from Trackside. And Gilliland just stood up for 31st overall. This and Jeff Burton up next. Yeah, this could be, I won't say the last bullet, but one of the biggest bullets left to shoot at Tony Stewart. Went back at practice, he was 20th quickest, but I know we interviewed him and he was really, really happy with his car. And he is definitely flirting with a top five run. Got a, that, that car looked really good right there. You know, it, it had that little bit of slide, but it was still moving ahead and you could tell he was wide open into the throttle. He just about like his teammate Clint Boyer. Now, early in the day, he had a really fast race car, got in trouble off of turn three, but it looks like Burton is going to be able to navigate that tricky part of this racetrack and is going to wind up eight quickest. 
5301, 169.77 miles per hour for Jeff Burton. Picked up about nine tenths of a second. A great week for NASCAR Race Hub. See that Monday through Thursday at 7 Eastern. The guests this week include Jeff Burton, Jeff Gordon, and Darian Grubb. More than a mouthful Mondays. And who doesn't love that? We love more than a mouthful Mondays. Uh -huh. Casey Mears brings his Chevrolet to the pit lane. 54.112. Mears just 33rd overall, but team locked in. Yeah, they, we'll have to see a couple more cars. They'll have, you have to beat two cars. There's no championship provisionals. So you've got to put, beat two cars to get locked in. And I think Wendy is with a guy that doesn't enjoy qualifying on time more than anybody than this guy. Well, he may not enjoy it, but at least he's smiling. Max Pappas will be the very last car to go out for qualifying. How difficult is it to chase this race car? No one, you have to race your way in every week. I mean, the pressure is on, you know, no, you know, I don't deny that definitely the pressure is on, but uh, uh, every time the game has been difficult, you know, we come up and uh, we give, uh, give it a great shot to the Geico team. I feel that uh, the best I can do is my 100% and uh, being offensive, of course, and uh, just extract uh, what we have, you know. Every day is a new game, you know, every qualifying is a new thing. So the important thing is uh, doing all you have and doing all you can and uh, that's what I do every time. And uh, when I'm done that, I'm proud. And uh, usually that uh, brings us really good results. So all right. I'm proud of that. Good luck to Max. I love listening. He's like a motivational speaker. We should all listen to Max Pappas. He is Wendy and uh, Travis Quapple in the 38 car, a little quicker than Casey Mears. And I misspoke Casey not locked into the show. Yeah, this team, this 38 team, Front Row Motorsports, they actually missed the Brickyard 400 last week with David Gilliland driving this car. Travis back in it this week. Going back to Max Pappas. Now, he qualified 20th here in the spring race and wound up finishing 34th. So, Max definitely knows how to get around this race racetrack. Yeah, Max, they've missed four races this year. But the good news, I was talking to Booty Barker, one of my buddies we shoot NASCAR performance with. They've qualified for at least the two biggest races, yep. the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400 last week. Hey, is Booty coming to trackside? Crew chief extravaganza. You know what? We can do that. I'll just go right by and pick him up too. Yes, sir. The bus needs to get a little bigger, though. I'm going to say. Crew chief express. Yeah. Dave Blaney, a veteran here, at Pocono, 21 starts for the Buckeye Bullet. So right now, for Dave to lock in, he would need to beat that 5378 of Travis Quapple. No, he would race on Sunday. That's the little green stripe on our tracker that represents Travis Quapple's time. Laney has one top 10 finish here. And 16 starts in this 2010 season. You know, while we're watching uh, Dave Laney qualify, I know we're in our go, or go home group. I keep going back to things that I saw and things that I heard at Indy. And Jimmy Johnson had a great comment in his post-race comments. And you know, the more I thought about it, the guy's absolutely right. He said, nobody in 2010 has been able to put a long, hot streak together and keep it. Yeah, the 29 car, Gil Martin, Kevin Harvey, they've been consistent, but nobody, you know, the 48 did it to the start of the season and back in June. The 11 did it in March, April, in, in part of May and June. But nobody's been able to do it and keep it there for a long period of time. Wonder why? I just think it's the competition. The competition, look at the guys that we've got this year. Is Dave Blaney's going to run his second lap right now. He's 34th quickest, second quickest of the go or go homers. Just look at teams we've got this year that were not even in the picture last year. More than anything, those three Richard Childress cars. And now all of a sudden, we're starting to see a little bit of spring in the step of the Rouse Fenway guys. I know we beat those guys up, but they do have three cars in the top 12 right now, talking about the Rouse Fenway group. They do. I mean, they're, they're a model of consistency, not of excellence, but at the same time, they're very consistent, very persistent, and they make the best out of the situations that are dealt. 
for Dave Blaney. Well, still winds up holding on to 34th quickest right now, and that locks in Travis Quapple in that 38 car. Qualifying continues here in Pocono. Stay with us here on speed. Qualifying continues here in Pocono. Michael McDowell in the 55 and Joe Nemechek in the 87 have locked themselves in to Sunday's show. So good qualifying effort by those two teams and drivers. David Stremme up next in the 26 car. And by the way, want to we talked about Jack Roush in practice. I want to update his condition. He crashed on Tuesday in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, on his way into a, uh, an aviation show. He's been moved from a hospital in Wisconsin to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And Jack is uh, in serious but stable condition, having some facial surgery. Uh, so just want to send our best wishes to Jack Roush. Yeah, hurry back. Uh, Jack, and we'll hang on oh. through there, David. It's not what you need when you're trying to make this race here at Pocono. Along with uh, Brenda Strickland, we're on Jack's private jet. And had a little mishap right there on landing, but it was good to see both of them walk away. Saw the stickers on those Roush Fenway cars. Said, said, Whoa, he got in that wall just a little he bit. Did. Saw those stickers that get back to the track, Jack. Yeah, and, and I'm sure as soon as the cat in the hat is up to it, he will be back. I would say David Strimmy will probably I think he's already shut it down, and I, I don't feel good about that lap no. there at all at 54-41. Of course, this team owned by Bill Jenkins, they actually missed the Brickyard 400 last week. He I just had his hands full in all three corners, especially turn two. You see it right there, get loose. Wow. You can see the steering wheel in the hands pretty much tell the tail right there. Yeah, he used a lot of racetrack up there, but then off of the exit of turn three, it was coming through there. He had it flat on the floor, it looks like, and Catches a piece of that safer barrier. I mean, he don't even get into the softer part of it. He actually hits concrete, looks like. Well, I mean, he knows it's go or go home, but that's a pretty hard lick on that 26 car. But I think with four cars left to go, that's going to be very borderline for David Streaming in this 26 group. Final four drivers, Todd Bodine, Landon Castle, who's in the 09, J.J. Yaley, and then Max Pappas. Now, that should, though, lock Dave Blaney into the show. So both the Prism Motorsports cars will race on Sunday, Micah McDowell and Dave Blaney. Todd Bodine has quite a bit of experience here at Pocono in the Cup Series, 13 starts. Actually won the pole for the 2001 Pennsylvania 500. We talked about it earlier, Todd was able to qualify this car at Indianapolis the other week. And then Chad McCombie qualified this 64 car back in June. Todd could not be here because of the National Camping World Truck Series schedule. Right now, just need to beat a 5411. That's Casey Mears. That's a little green stripe right there that he's sitting right on top of right now in the 64 car. And Larry, as you said a moment ago, Dave Blaney is in fact locked into the show. Todd held a charity golf tournament up here in the Pennsylvania area. I, I don't remember the exact name, but I think it was like called the U.S. Onion Open or it something. It had something to do with onion, yes. Yes, it did. <laughs> onion slice, they said. Clever. Yeah, very clever. Larry, you ever sliced a golf ball? Only every time I hit it. Okay. Yeah, I talked to Todd's wife, and they were hoping to raise money for pediatric hospitals up near here. Now, that's when... I hit it far enough to consider it a slice. <laughs> I, I figured it's still out. to bring that up. I've, I've been bowling and I've been golfing. I've got my scores backwards. Uh -huh. my, 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 my golf score is higher than my bowling score. Got to work on that. That's not good. Either one of them. No, not at all. Todd's going to shut it down. But the good news for that, that will lock Casey Mears in that 36 car in. That's a car that missed the Brickyard last week. Well, can Tony Stewart hang on for his 12th career poll? We'll find out shortly. Stay with us here at Pocono. Speed's presentation of NASCAR Sprint Cup qualifying for Pocono is presented by Subway Restaurants. So many $5 foot-long subs to choose from. Enjoy amazing value at Subway all day, every day. Brought to you in part by Kills Primers. Kills, the perfect start to a great finish and by Sprint, the NOW Network. 
Landon Castle in the 09 car has locked himself into the show. I'm gonna tell you what though, JJ Yaley in this 46 car, he didn't mess around. He went straight to the top of the go or go homers and he is at a 53.69. Had a rough, rough, rough two days at the Brickyard 400 last week. Did not miss the show. In fact, they've missed the last two shows at Chicagoland in the Brickyard, but he will race on Sunday. Yeah, good, good comeback by this uh, operation to get him in the show here today. And David Stremme, unfortunately, will not race in that 26 car on Sunday. He is bumped out. So you know what this means, guys? It's going to come down to one. Max Pappas. Todd Bodine. Max is the final car to take qualifying here. Better call up Booty Barker said he got to work some magic. Tell you what, he qualified about mid-pack here in June. Ended up qualifying 20th. As mentioned, qualified for the Brickyard 400. But what an explosion under the hood of that 13 car early, early in the race. Big time engine failure. As they like to say, something coming up. Max ran a 55.04 in practice. So he's gonna need to pick up a, need to pick up about nine tenths, which we've seen a lot of cars do. And, and the clouds, they've kind of been going in and, and the sun's been coming in, going out. Just it's it's not been really consistent during his qualifying session. Yeah, he's not gonna get much help from that. Right now, turn three has got some sun on it where before it was in total shade so it's gonna be up to max whether or not he can pull this out he has to be to the left of the green stripe that represents todd bodine in that 64 car who's 40th right now i don't see I any don't see signs yet no. and he's got one corner to go didn't get it done in turn one or turn two Got to nail turn three if he wants to have a chance. You know, I don't see the car doing anything strange, Jeff. You, you almost wonder, uh, did, did, he, did he ramp it up like he needed to ramp it up? And that first lap's not going to do it. In fact, he's the slowest of the go or go home cars. As they say, he'll have to play two now for sure. And hopefully the car has got enough in it. Car did wash up the racetrack just a little bit in turn one, like he had to really hesitate in the middle of the corner picking up the throttle. It's looking like it might be a little better lap possibly than, than the first one, but I don't think it's gonna be good enough. I mean, I even look in there and I don't really see his hands doing a whole lot of anything crazy. Yeah, Larry, like you said, it looks like it just doesn't have speed to it. No. You know, and there's no question, the track's got a lot more grip right now than when he was out there practicing earlier, but it doesn't look like Max Pappas will race on Sunday. Nope. But Todd Bodine qualifies and will race. So 12th career pole for Tony Stewart in his 413th NASCAR Sprint Cup Series race. Second pole of 2010. Stewart also taking the pole at Texas. We'll take a break, come back and talk to the pole sitter when we return here on Speed. Tony Stewart, a two-time winner here at the Pocono Raceway in Long Pond, Pennsylvania. Let's take a look at our front row for Sunday's race. Second pole to go with two wins for Tony Stewart and his second pole of 2010. What I see right there is two guys that desperately, desperately want to win in 2010. You got that right. Could be the beginning of a great battle all day Sunday. Bob Dillner standing by with Tony Stewart. And how about Tony Stewart? Not too shabby. Two poles already this year. Texas and now here. What does the world come to? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I was at Fargo, North Dakota last night racing a wing sprint car, and I was really, really upset because I uh, I crashed running second. Crashed myself by myself into a into a marker tire on the inside. And uh, Donnie shots the last thing he told me before I left. He goes, take it out on them guys tomorrow. So I guess we took it out on the on the stopwatch today. So I'm really proud of that. So uh, it, it's a good day for the office depot, especially Chevy and, and everybody at at uh, Stuart Haas Racing and. Uh, everybody at Hendrick uh, Engines and Chassis, they've done a great job. I mean, this is a big power track and, uh, you know, the Hendrick Power Show today. I'll tell you what, his hand's pretty tired as well. He signed over a couple hundred autographs here on his way to Victory Lane to be presented the Paul Trophy. 
Yeah, before that pole at Texas, Tony had went 155 races without a pole, now two in 2010. A lot of Chevrolets there up at the starting, uh, front of the starting grid. Denny Hamlin told Gotta us a watch. lot of work to do on an 11 car. He's won the last two races here. Good qualifying effort right there by Brad Keselowski, row number six. Our points leader, Kevin Harvick, outside of row seven. A little bit further back. Go through the rest of the starting grid for Sunday's race. And we saw you're way, way, way back in the back. He's lucky to still have a race car. Well, Rick Allen, Phil Parsons, and Daryl Waltrip anxiously standing by to bring you happy hour. Trying to push us out of here. Yeah, for the Camping World Truck Series.